Welcome to the Facts vs. Feelings podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Dietrich, and I'm joined by my co-host, Sonu Varghese. Cutting through the noise in 30 minutes each week with Ryan Dietrich, Chief Market Strategist, and Sonu Varghese, VP Global Macro Strategist, taking out the boring and helping investors focus on what really matters. A quick note before we start the show. Investment advisory services offered through CWM LLC, an SEC registered investment advisor. Carson Partners, the division of CWM LLC, is a nationwide partnership of advisors. Hi, everybody. Welcome to an extremely special. They're all special. I mean, it's like children, right? They're all special, Sonu. But this one's even more special than some other ones. This is welcome to episode 67 of Carson's Facts versus Feelings with Ryan and Sonu. Sonu, this one is sponsored by Y Charts. And we're calling it Welcome to Our 2024 Outlook. We made it. 2023 is in the rearview mirror. Um, (laughs) Before we even get there, we're going to talk. Listen, this will be a lot of fun. We've obviously had some calls. If you listen to this podcast, you probably have a little bit of a clue what we're about to talk about. But we're going to break down kind of how we see the world potentially unfolding. But I want to start with this, Sonu. Um, I'll go to you in a second. My 2024 started like this. I was taking down my Christmas lights last Wednesday. I bent over and my back locked up on me and I was in some pain. Um, I have my back. I've had back issues over the years. And fortunately, this one, I went to my chiropractor literally as soon as you and I are done here. I I got to go to my chiropractor (laughs) again. And uh, I'm feeling a lot better. I was worried this time a week ago. It's like, oh, that's not good. Um, How's 2024 treating you so far, though? So far, so good. 2023 was actually a good year, I, all things considered on balance. I mean, even professionally for us, right? But yeah, so actually speaking of 2024, you know what we did last weekend? My family and I, or I think I forced them to list, spend the afternoon on Saturday, 45 minutes listening to the entire album, Dark Side of the Moon by Pink Floyd. Wow. <laughs> No, we were wow. actually at the Adler mm-hmm. Planetarium and they had a show, Dark Side of the Moon, with simulations yeah. and, you know, so it's, you know, if you've ever been to a planetarium, you're seated in this dome type structure, there's images going all around you, in front of you, side of you, all of it. There were like, I think, 150 people in that show. It was phenomenal. I mean, they just played the entire album, 45 minutes, Neat. and my daughter went to sleep. <laughs> so my, yeah. my son, who's uh, the seven-year-old twins, so, so you know, seven-year-old boy, mm-hmm. you know, it's not easy for them to sit still. And he actually kind of made it through 45 minutes. He was just enthralled. With, you know, we were going through asteroid showers and yeah. planets and all of that. It was amazing. Well, so that's, that's what I did. That's how my I started my 2024. That's good. She's probably not the first person to pass out at a Pink Floyd concert, so that's, that's okay. Uh, she didn't do it that way. I will say this: I saw I saw Les Claypool. He does. He's a Primus uh, yeah. lead singer, and he he did uh, like two months ago. He did Animals, the the full album. His oh, Les Claypool wow. and the Frog Brig- Flying Frog Brigade. Kind of hard to say. I saw that was really cool. That he did the whole album of of Animals uh, from Pink Neat. Floyd. Anyway, so enough of that. I didn't know we we're going to go that route, but that was kind of fun. <laughs> so new. It is Outlook time. Um, again, episode 67, Facts versus Feelings, sponsored by Y Charts. Let's just get into it. Let's kind of start where we – we'll give our views in a second. No, you, what do you just – let's do it up top. Let's do it up top. Why not? Yeah. You want to just do a cl- quick Cliff Notes version? Here it is, everybody. As soon as I'm done, you can just sign off, I guess. <laughs> we, we think the odds of a recession are still quite slim. We do not think there's going to be a recession. Yeah. We think the S&P 500 will gain between 11 and – oh, what is this? 11, 13%. 13. 13. I think I know yeah. this. I only wrote the thing. <laughs> 11 and 13% and then bonds um, between 5 and 6% on the year. So all in all, we think the uh, good times are still coming. So you can sign off now yeah. if you want, or you can stay as we really get into it. But sort of – Last year was an amazing year, really, for investors, uh, for stocks and bonds. Now, the bonds took a – we talked about it last week. Bonds had a ninth-inning rally like, boy, oh, boy, we've never wow. seen before. Um, what was your biggest surprise, you think, from last year? Were stocks up 25 26% total return? Bonds up, you know, 5 6%, give or take. Um and even gold, gold is up 12%. I mean, cryptocurrency is up a lot. I mean, there, there was a, a lot of people made a lot of money last year. What was your biggest surprise? It has to be – you know, I'll take the economic side of it. Markets, you know, you always – are looking markets will always surprise you because it's kind of mm-hmm. you know it's hard to predict so I, i'm not saying it, it's what markets do is always in a sense a surprise for me you know? yeah. hopefully more often good than bad but the economy really the fact that economic growth accelerated over trend we got q3 the third quarter gdp growth was close to five percent that was huge i mean i can't say i expected that no i mean obviously right. last year this time we were talking about our outlook 2023, the edge of normal. It's that we didn't expect a recession. 
but I didn't expect a quarter with close to 5% growth, right? I didn't expect employment gains, payrolls to gain 2.7 million jobs over the last year. No, I would have thought it more between two and two and two and a half million or so. I would have, I, I think I was expecting GDP growth closer to maybe, you know, one and a half to 2%, considering we just went through the, you know, most aggressive tightening cycle by the Federal Reserve in 40 plus years, uh, responding to 40 plus highs, highs in inflation, right? So all of that is like, okay, one and a half to two percent growth. I mean, slightly below trend. It's still mm-hmm. good. It's not a recession, but we are above trend. We are going to be two and a half to three percent. So yes, that's my surprise for 2023. Uh, well said there. Again, if longtime listeners know we were one of the very few shops that this time a year ago was saying there's likely no recession. The second sentence of our 2023 outlook actually talked about the idea of potentially making new all time highs. Now, the, the S&P did on a total return basis. The Dow did. But on a pure price, the S&P hasn't quite yet. But the bottom line is, you know, we had some pretty good calls last year. If you listen to this podcast, you know. Um, but here's what surprises me, I think, the most. You're, you're right. So I'm just going to. Yeah, what surprised you know what surprises me was just how the year played out, almost a script. Honest to goodness, when you have um, you know third the third year of presidential cycle with the first term president, you know what happens? Stocks usually gain twenty percent. Oh, by the way, first half of a pre election year usually pretty strong. That played out third quarter. You get your seasonal weakness. Oh, and then you get a sprint into the end of the year, and that that, that it does those things really really played out. Literally this time a year ago, we were talking about when you have a lot of strength early January when January is strong. There's certain things January barometer. We'll talk about all this stuff over the next coming weeks of, of this podcast, but. There were so many clues early in the year that it was going to be a really good year for investors, and it was. What fascinates me is how many people disagreed with it, how many people doubted it, and how many people just honestly and unfortunately missed out on on some really nice yeah. opportunities, even though the – the um, you know, the warning signs were truly, or maybe I'll say the tea leaves is a better way to put it. The tea leaves were there for a good year. So that's enough about last year. We, we know it. You know, we, we had a decent call on our team. We're really proud of that. But what are we going to do now? So I, I guess I kind of scribbled down. I mean, you know, the four things I want to talk about, the economy and productivity, kind of put that together, mm-hmm. Fed policy, and then stocks and bonds. So let's start with, I guess, the economy and, and productivity. Um, I think it's kind of drives a lot of our views for the other things mm-hmm. as you knock down this first domino. So t- tell me this. Um, we didn't have a recession last year. You still don't see a recession. What are some of the main reasons, even though, oh, by the way, let me be clear here, every, just about every 85% of economists, according to um, Financial Times, and believe me, it just it felt like that was an accurate number. 85% of economists last year expected a recession. Now I'm looking around, everybody's saying mild recession. Mild recession. It's going to be a mild. We're being promised a mild recession this time. We were promised a recession last time. You, one of the very few macro strategists out there, I'm not going to call you economist, not going to insult you like that, I'm going to call you a macro, call you a macro strategist, you. That, that, that said there's no recession. You still feel that way. But what are the main drivers, in your opinion, that we can avoid a recession? And let's be clear, there's two sides every coin. What could upset the apple cart and potentially push us into the mild recession that so many people are talking about? You know, a big reason, if you just think about the U.S. economy, what 65 to 70 percent is consumption. Mm -hmm. So look there, just start from there. You don't really have to start from anywhere else. So what was the big reason we thought we would avoid a recession in 2023? And it's the same reason we think we'll avoid a recession in 2024. Housing, the labor market's been strong, but even household net worth right? Like this is not a debt driven cycle. I think the last couple of cycles, economic cycles is, you know, even the 2000s, you had a lot of people taking on mortgage debt, right? And that was the housing boom was a big factor in economic growth. That's not what we have now. Household net worth is in a very good place. Mm -hmm. It's relative to pre pandemic and literally most of the periods over the last 30 years, net worth, right? You know, how assets minus liabilities as a percent of disposable income, that's 750% right now, Ryan. And this is looking at the aggregate you know, households across the economy. Yeah. Before the pandemic, it was around 675%. As I said, there's two sides to net worth, assets, liabilities, right? Asset values have increased over the last four years. Real estate, mm-hmm. home prices are up, stocks yeah. are up, and yeah. even deposits. People have more money in the bank. I mean, yes, thanks to government you know, checks, all of that. But there are, fact of the matter is there are more assets, right? And then liabilities, the other side, we talk about credit card debt. You and I have mm-hmm. talked about trillion dollars oh, yeah. credit card debt. Mm-hmm. Guess what? Nominal GDP before the pandemic was about 21, 22 trillion. Now it's 28 trillion. So that's also the denominator has gone up. You always talk about denominator mm-hmm. blindness. Liabilities as a percent of disposable income haven't gone up relative to the, you know, where we were pre-pandemic. It's still about 100% of disposable income. 
pretty much where we were pre-pandemic. Uh, before, in 2007, it was a lot higher, right? And that's why the great financial crisis was such a big blow to the economy. So all this to say, households are less leveraged right now. They've got net worth is a lot higher as a result of that. And then, you know, stock prices continue to go up. Home prices continue to go up. And this is all, you know, I, I just don't see a recession. I'll put it at that. No, no. Well said there. I will say um, there is a the white paper of this outlook. You can go to CarsonGroup.com to see that. And you you talked about it. It's chart four in the outlook. I'm looking right at it. American households are in much better position financially. And again, you can go look at what we're talking about. But I think it blows people's minds because they hear about all this debt that's out there. The government has all this debt. Consumers have all this debt. Corporations have all this debt. But again, talk to me one more time soon about the idea that a lot of that debt was locked in at a lot lower levels. I mean, the, the truth, again, a lot of large companies locked in debt had historically cheap levels yeah. a couple of years ago. Then they're making four or five, six percent on cash. I mean, I think that's one of the big reasons large caps did so darn well last year because they locked in debt at one level and they were just printing money on the other side. Um, that was harder for small companies because they did not have the opportunity to lock in as much debt. That's why exactly. when the yields went higher, rates went higher, small caps didn't do as well. But then we know what happened. We talked last week about the huge rally in small caps last month. But again, just talk to me about the idea of, of um, why having a lot of this debt locked in at different levels, lower levels maybe, is, is kind of the key to the whole thing. So when you think debt, whether it's corporate debt, household debt, government debt is a little different. So I'll put that mm -hmm. to the side, yeah. right? Corporate debt, household debt is really, in a, in, a, in a sense, that's more scary, right? If that goes up a lot, because at, at one time, the ground could, you know, somebody could pull the rug from under you, whoever it is, right? And for businesses, less earnings for households, is you lose a job and suddenly you're, you know, you're in big trouble. So you always want to look at debt relative to income. We just talked mm -hmm. about that relative to disposable income because disposable income has gone up a lot over the last four years. That's in a, you know, reasonable looking place. But the other side is exactly what you pointed out. A lot of that debt, especially most, there's, consumers have about $18 trillion of debt. About 12 to $13 trillion of that is mortgage debt. So the bulk of this is mortgage debt. The rest is mm -hmm. student loans, credit card debt, stuff like that, right? Most mortgage debt, Ryan, you know, the effective mortgage rate on mortgage, total mortgage, outstanding mortgage debt right now in the U.S. is about 3.5%. Hmm. And yeah. everyone in the bank, remember I said that deposits, a lot of deposits, they're getting a lot more on that side. So it's almost like the Fed, ironically, I, I mean, I, I mean this only half jokingly, the Fed by raising rates is sort of like putting more money into the system, paying people yeah. more for the money they have in, uh, at the banks, right? So there's a little more stimulus. Of you. I, I mean, I, I don't want to make it seem like, you, you know, uh, the Fed raising rates is stimulus spending, but there is an sure. aspect of that, if that makes sense. No, it, it does. I mean, again, this time, oh, three, four years ago, one of the knocks you know, in, the, in our industry was, well, I can't get anything on my cash. And that's true. You couldn't now. Now you absolutely can. So so that's the economy. We think the consumer is strong. Let's talk a little bit about the employment backdrop, because if the consumer drives so much of the economy like they do, we just had a jobs number. We can talk in real time, I guess, that jobs number <laughs> on Friday. I mean, what do you see in the jobs number on Friday and how does it pertain to the rest of this year from an employment backdrop? If people are still getting hired and people are still making money, you got to think that 70% of the economy is in good shape. What do you think there? Yeah, you asked what, what was my story of last year, what surprised me. I think it was really, you know, the economy defied expectations, but a lot of this had to do with the labor market. Mm -hmm. Most people thought the Fed would break the labor market, and which is why, yeah. by the way, they predicted a recession, right? Now, we didn't think the mm -hmm. Fed would break the labor market, but it held, right? What's happened since then is, look, hiring Z's, no question about it. Bef at the beginning of 200, 2023, we are creating about 300, 350 jobs right. a month. We are down to 150, 170,000, right? Uh, over the last three months, it's averaged about 165,000. By the way, that's still a good number in 2019. The average monthly job creation is 163,000. So we're right there. Unemployment rate, 3.7%, also really low. 23rd straight month below 4%. So we're in a good place with respect to the labor market. Layoffs, Ryan, are really low. It's much lower. If you look at layoffs as a percent of the labor force, because the labor mm -hmm. force has grown since 2019, it's running at 1% right now, right? Wow. Before the pandemic, it was 1.2, 1.3%. So it, it, I think a couple of years back, there was this thing going around about like the great resignation. People are quitting jobs for higher mm -hmm. pay. Wage growth is increasing. Quits have come down a lot. Layoffs are really low. So it's almost like the great stay, yeah. right? Instead of the great, res instead of the great resignation, you have the great stay, as somebody at Twitter called it, which is interesting. But, but that's the reality of what's happened. Layoffs are low. The labor market is a pretty healthy place. And 
you know, at, at the same time, wage growth has eased as well. So I think the inflation problem is, you know, for a practical purpose, can I just say the inflation problem has gone away? No, nah, and we've hammered that home, I think, a lot that inflation was going to come back this time a year ago. We said inflation was going to come back more than probably a lot of people expected that would allow the Fed to potentially pivot eventually. And we saw that. It's funny because this time two years ago, I was looking around saying, you know, maybe I want to go across the street, work somewhere else and, you know, get a little bump <laughs> in pay. And that's exactly what I did. And now you mentioned it now. I'm, I am very happy where I am. I have no desire to go anywhere else. So and I think a lot of, yeah, yeah, I think a lot of people are in that camp. And that's what I want to talk about next. Productivity This is kind of part two of this because our country hired oh gee what was it 4.8 million people two years ago um what was it 2.7 million approximately yeah. last year so close enough for government work let's just say we added 8 million jobs and and, and one other thing i want to point out though you mentioned layoffs a uh, challenger has a survey I believe everybody's got a survey right but challenger survey said layoffs are at an eight month low so you don't really have people quitting you don't really have people getting laid off you hired 8 million or so odd people the last two years so talk to me about the idea of productivity so new because we've got ai out there we're going to talk about ai for productivity mm -hmm. also but how productivity is such a key. And I guess the answer is, listen, if you're always going across the street getting 10% more, it takes a while to get trained up, to learn totally. everything. I've been totally. here for 18, 19 months. I'm finally learning what I'm supposed to do every day. It took me, it took me a minute over Carson. But now I know what I'm supposed to do. I'm a good example of this. I think now people know what they're doing, but they're not looking to leave. That can be a big deal to productivity. How is that kind of the, oh, I don't know, the bow on top of this whole big economic cycle of growth we see from a productivity point of view? And I would say it's a bow on top of our outlook too, in a way, right? Exactly. And, and, mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll relate it to like, we're calling our outlook eye to eye, seeing eye to yes. eye. Yes. Look, economists and strategists have, as we've just talked about, been all over the place over the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. COVID, I think, really messed things up, forecasting models, traditional mm -hmm. models, like you just said, everyone thought the labor market would break. It didn't, right? In a sense, this time really was different. The Fed raised rates really fast, but there was no recession. Markets bounced back as well in 2023. So we didn't see eye to eye with most of the mm -hmm. forecasters. Now momentum, everyone's sort of getting on the bad mag, you know, maybe mm. markets will be good, positive. And, you know, we are in that same camp too. I think we are saying market returns will maybe be a little higher than a lot of other people expect. Mm. But we do have a contrarian call, and that gets to what you just talked about, productivity, right? One thing with our outlook is, you know, we are discussing not just 2024, but we're looking beyond as well. Most mm -hmm. other look, outlooks are talking about just the short term. Right. And I think our big contrarian call, where we're not seeing eye to eye with everyone else, is we think we are in a period for improved productivity growth, and that could be the story over the next several years, right? Like you mentioned, AI was a big story in 2023, but this is just mm -hmm. the start, right? Yes. It's not like technological improvements. If you think about the automobile or the PC, we didn't see the impact of that until like 15, 20 years down the line, right? It, I don't think AI is going to take that long to, you know, come in, but it may happen quicker, but it's really about what's happening. What's the foundation for AI to flourish and thrive? That's, you know, uh, and, and it gets to, we have a tight labor market, right? Mm -hmm. What needs to happen for productivity to go up? Businesses have to invest. When do mm -hmm. businesses invest if labor is expensive? Right. If labor, mm -hmm. if the labor market is tight, if the labor market, it's hard to find good people. You always hear that. So what sure. do you do? You know what? I'm going to invest in productivity improvements. Right. And that's good for the aggregate economy. Mm -hmm. Now, well said there. You mentioned automobiles. I always think of the uh, Henry Ford quote. He's like, if I'd given people what they wanted, I would have made a faster horse. You know, so anyway, that's, that's kind of love that. Yeah, that's, that's, a awesome. good Henry, that's a good one there. Uh, I, I assume he said it. I don't. It's like the Mark Twain quotes. He gets all the quotes. Um, but again, so the bottom line again, if product, we're about to, we think we're about to see a major surge in productivity in our country, and that's not just something that matters for 2024. It could matter for several years because, mm -hmm. so no, let's talk a little bit about the the mid 90s. Another theme that we kind of have uh, going on. If you listen to this podcast, you know this, but some similarities with the mid 90s. In the mid 90s, what happened? 94. Greenspan hiked rates a lot, upset the apple cart. Orange County went under. Stocks didn't do well. Bonds had one of their worst years ever. Sound kind of familiar. 2022, you know, in the early last year with the regional bank crisis, we're literally the 16th largest bank in the country, which is gone, you know, like like a day later. Um, you know, so that that upset the apple cart. But then in 95, Greenspan, there's actually videos. You can you can Google it. You can you see it on YouTube. He's talking in Greenspan speak, so no one truly <laughs> understands it. But if you decipher it, he's saying it, it, productivity is running high right now. It could stay 
stay high. That means I can cut interest rates. That means there will be a cap on inflation. Oh, and by the way, wages likely can stay higher. That sounds like a perfect scenario because, honestly, that's what everybody wants to see. In the mid to late 90s, that's kind of what happened, where stocks did amazing, as, as we know. The economy did very well, flourish. Internet, the uh, excitement was starting to show. I mean, you know, Soto, talk to me a little bit about the, some of those similarities because right now we've got maybe, you know, inflation capped with productivity higher, wages stay high, and we've got a Fed that's going to start cutting. We'll talk about the Fed now, or maybe you can weave in the Fed now or after this yeah. answer, but that's the kind of the next step of our conversation, how this all, how productivity matters to the Fed. You want to take it away there? No, I think you said it. Like, long story short, if you have higher productivity, you can have strong mm-hmm. wage growth. Mm-hmm. Strong wage growth always worries the Fed. But yep. if you have strong productivity, you can have strong wage growth at relatively low inflation. That's literally what, mm-hmm. in fact, that was a bet Greenspan made in 1995. And he said, you know mm-hmm. what, I'm going to stop raising rates. And by, I think by 96, they'd ro- ro- mm-hmm. drop rates like yeah. three by 75, by 0.75% or so. It was not a lot, but they eased, right? So mm-hmm. what happens is it can, this can create a positive feedback loop between monetary policy and productivity. So as I said, strong productivity growth is that's accompanied by low inflation. The Fed's happy about that. And they can say, you know what? We don't have to raise rates. We can ease rates. That's more expansionary monetary policy. That can lead to, you know, if you have easier rates, lower rates, what happens? More investment, right? And at the same time, tighter labor markets with low unemployment and faster wage growth, that further fuels productivity growth and again signals again to the central bank that they can keep rates low, right? So I think you're in we could get into this positive feedback loop between productivity, monetary policy, investment, labor markets. So the cycle there, of course. What's the risk here, right? We have to talk about mm-hmm. what's the risk. Uh, what could upset the apple cart? Well, mm-hmm. the Fed could keep rates longer than they need to, right? Yeah. I think given where inflation is, it's, it's going to talk about the Fed. I, I, I think Powell, the Powell-led Fed has been quick to pivot. Mm-hmm. They pivoted in 2019 pretty quickly. They pivoted in 2020 when the recession, you know, when COVID hit, they were really quick to pivot. Within two weeks, they cut rates to zero. And then when, yes, they were behind the curve with inflation, but they caught up pretty quickly, oh. right? So zero to 5%. Remember, so I think we can see sorry. a quick pivot again. Remember, um, Ed over at uh, Ned Davis Research, Ed Clissold joined us and he talked about the Fed and Green, uh, not Greenspan, sorry. Um, um, oh my goodness. <laughs> I'm doing too much at once here, Sonu. Um, who's in charge of the Fed right now? What's his Powell, name? Powell, oh, Powell, Powell, gee whiz. <laughs> only do this for a living. Powell, he pointed out that, you know, Powell was kind of, transitory 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 when he was looking for a new job and then when he finally got the the, the new job then he kind of changed his tune so i thought that was kind of interesting how that worked out but overall the fed you know they we'd, we'd say they get a b or a c probably but i think the door is clearly open uh for more cuts now do you think that i mean there was a chance you're telling me there's a chance that there was going to be some cuts in march but uh it seems like futures have changed a little bit after that last jobs print do you still think may could be the first cut next year or i see what i did it again Next year. I meant this year. <laughs> this year. This year. 2024. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we're already looking to 2025. How about that? But, yeah. you know, we were just talking about the productivity cycle, and that's a longer term mm-hmm. story more than just exactly. 2024, right? Short term productivity could, numbers could be all over the place. It's hard to measure productivity, right? Mm-hmm. But yeah. you almost know it. I think Claudia Sam was on our podcast. She talked yeah. about it as well. She said, you only know after the fact, right? But then, we are not in the business of doing things after the fact, right? In our, in our world of investments, we have to look ahead. We have to try to see where things are going. And and this is the, you know, this is what we think will happen, right? So mm-hmm. go, I, I forget your question again. Sorry, I, I lost track. <laughs> um, You know what? I, I'm not even sure what the question was either. So that's okay. We can, <laughs> no. we can kind of, we can kind of put I, a bow, I, I, bow on it here. Um, You know, the Fed likely will continue to oh, start. Cut, oh, actually, when the cut, cut, when the cut. Yeah, cut. March versus yes. May. There we go. There yeah. We go. Look, I've been in the camp that March is sort of like 50-50. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of data. We have another, we have three inflation reports to come before the March meeting. So there's a lot of data to come, two more payroll reports. So I've always been in the camp that I think March is 50 50. On New Year's Eve, markets ran with the expectation that, you know, 90% probability of a March rate cut. I thought that was too high given, yeah. you know, we have a lot of data left to come. And I think markets are now pulled back. The odds of a March rate cut to 60%. That's probably why you've seen. The equity market go down a little bit because, you know, they're not suddenly as optimistic as before. Mm-hmm. doesn't mean the Fed is not going to cut. I'm still in the camp. I think we could see a 
you know, maybe I'd put a 75% probability on a make cut. So odds are on for a make cut. By June, I think, I mean, if the inflation data goes along like the way we expect, I think 100% chance of at least one rate cut by June, if not two. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and we've got, by the time people listen to this very podcast, they maybe have already got a little clue of what CPI is doing and PPI, which are coming out later this week. Um, So again, this is episode 67 of Carson's Facts versus Feelings. Welcome to our 2024 Outlook, sponsored by Ycharts. Let's take a little break for a second. So I think, you know, I've realized... So we've talked about the economy, we've talked about the Fed, we've talked about productivity. We're going to talk about stocks and bonds here in the next 10 minutes or so as we wrap things up. But I realize, you know, I, I, I kind of, I've, I've, I've made a couple, you know, I forgot what I was supposed to say a time or two. I think I know why. I think I know what's going on. You and I are not drinking milkshakes. You want to talk about why milkshakes oh. matter? We said productivity matters. Why do milkshakes matter when you and I do these things? We just need a sugar rush. That's why it matters. There you go. There you go. <laughs> no, Ryan, is, so for everyone listening, we have yeah. this thing before every, I mean, it's not like we w- started working together, uh, you know, too long ago, but two years feels like a long time. Yeah. 67 yeah. episodes. Are we episode 67 right this, now? This, so. that's, that's, that's what they're telling me. I guess it's episode <laughs> 67. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. That's, a, that's a long time. That's more than a year. Mm. So, but no, we like to get a milkshake. I mean, it's not coffee. I'm a coffee person. Ryan doesn't drink coffee. So mm. we can't go out and get grab a coffee before we do a live you know, a uh, live session in front of audiences and things like that. So milkshake it is. I, I think it started mm. when I was trying to look for you in Vegas. We were supposed to do yeah. a panel in Vegas, just both of us. I mean, a facts versus yep. feelings live or something. I was like, where is this guy? I mean, my first thought is, let me look at the coffee shop. Obviously, you're not there because you don't drink coffee or chai yeah. or anything, any of that stuff. Well, he was at, at a milkshake bar. <laughs> I think that's the best yeah. way to put it. <laughs> yeah, I was hungry. I think I was my lunch. Yeah, was a, one of those milkshakes that literally have like a steak and a brownie on top of them. Yeah, one of those. One of those. But anyway, um, all right. So that's good. St- I had one more thing I was going to say. Um, oh yeah, live stream. So uh, hopefully yes. by the time people listen to this on this coming Thursday, the eleventh, um, it's in the afternoon. Do you have the exact time? So new. I think it's. Oh gosh. I think it's one o'clock Eastern. I'll have looked that up. But sometime this Thursday afternoon, you can follow Sonu and myself okay. on social media or Carson Group. Um, we're going to live pretty much this, this conversation, to be honest, but another live version of our Outlook. We're really excited to um, to share that live stream, which will be coming up this Thursday afternoon. Um, no, I would but... have messaged someone during this, but I've, I just realized I've turned everything off because yeah, <laughs> I don't want <laughs> So. Uh, yeah, it's 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 this Thursday afternoon. We know that. Follow us. Yeah. We've we've shared the couple. We'll share it a lot on on social media. All right, so let's finish things up here, Sona, in the next ten minutes or so with stocks and bonds. I guess we'll start yes. with stocks again. Last year at this time, we were talking about the potential for new all time highs. We said the S and P gained between twelve and fifteen percent. Obviously, gained over twenty five percent on a total return basis. That was one of the more optimistic views out there. Um, we did up grade our view at the middle of the year to between 21 to 25 percent expecting a strong year and rally fortunately that that did take place um so we'll start this we'll, we'll do the stocks part first we'll do bonds in a second so in this year again we're looking between 11 to 13 percent again likely new highs are probably coming uh, there's a few things that we're looking at we potentially have record earnings i mean so much of our view matters on the macro point of view and the policy points of view that you just talked about and you know one thing we did skip so now maybe we should touch on this for because it matters for stocks too we talked about you know monetary policy but fiscal policy matters too uh, from yes. the manufacturing side of things and housing side of things so maybe very very quickly talk to me about manufacturing and housing how those are kind of wild cards for the economy and again think about this if these things are going well it probably means the stock market is going to do well i want to touch right. on those i mean with housing the key drive uh, not it's not the only driver the key driver mm-hmm. is really demand right and then supply yep. to, it, to an extent and we have a big cohort of millennials who want homes there aren't enough homes so that's why we talk about home prices going up right for mm-hmm. at, at least those people who own a home but home ownership is at 66 percent, so it is relatively high right now it's not like home ownership rates are very low or nothing like that right but the other side so interest rates matter a lot for yep. uh, housing right and, and of course that's on the fed side of things but fiscal is yeah, goodness, uh, you had that blog end of last year showing you charts of the year. You got it from the rest, all mm-hmm. of us from on the team. My chart of the year was manufacturing mm-hmm. construction, right? Mm-hmm. It was up about 100% after yeah. adjusting for inflation relative to 2020. 
Oh, that's how much it, it's doubled, right? And then a lot of it is because of semiconductor plants, mm -hmm. e electric vehicle battery plants, things like that. Yeah. So there's a lot happen happening in America right now. I think it's a big story. Uh, I think the high-tech manufacturing, construction, factories, things like that, that's up like, what, 600%, something ridiculous like that. It just looks like one of those dot-com chart, dot com stock charts, right? It, that's how, I've never seen an economic data chart mm -hmm. like that. I'll put it that way. So that's, a lot of it has to do with fiscal policy, but it's not like the government's putting that money into a factory or anything like that. It's still private businesses investing. Mm -hmm. It's just that the government's made it easier to do that. And it's, a, a lot of it is part of that story of, you know, reshoring. It's not really nearshoring mm -hmm. if it's in America, it's reshoring really. And making a supply chains more robust, right? We, we saw what, you know, efficient supply chains that if extended across the world from China, Malaysia, Philippines, India, like look where that got us in 2020 uh, during COVID. They're mm -hmm. like, you know what? Let's bring stuff home. That's what's happening. No, uh, exactly. I think people realize, you know what? When we want our microchip, we want our microchip. Maybe we're going to have to pay a tad more for it because we're making it here, but the government is bringing these things back, the incredible construction. And you think about the idea of productivity again, we're building these high-tech plants. We're building so many things right now. We're not really getting the fruits of that labor yet, yes. but that could be coming. So again, those are some of the big contextual things we look at that we say, listen, if the economy can avoid a recession, if the Fed is no longer a headwind, maybe now a tailwind, inflation's back, the things we just talked about the first 30 minutes or so of this podcast, now that means, you know, hey, we're still overweight equities, right? We've been overweight equities since the middle of December of 2022. It was widely hated. It was widely mocked. Um, we've had pullbacks in March. We had the big pullback in October. It can, a lot, of, a lot of opinions going around. We actually added equity risk. We probably talked about it in this very, very podcast. Um, you know, why we did that, why we remained overweight equities. And we're still there. Now, so there's some interesting um, things. You know, we're looking at record earnings. We're looking at profit mm -hmm. margins remaining uh, higher than expected. Uh, that a lot of people expect CapEx, capital expenditures, 12, right. 12 months out are all-time highs. These are positive things along with the macro front. But here's one thing. The key maybe could be a midterm year. And here's what I mean by that. When a midterm year is down, last I checked, we're down like 20%. Remember two years ago, that wasn't very good, right? When a midterm year is down, the um, election year has been higher eight out of the last eight times. So that's this upcoming year. That's 13% average. Here's the real wild one. A pre-election year, which was just higher last time, higher nine of the last nine times, up almost 25% on average. So when you're down in a midterm year, which tends to happen, that could be a very bullish signal. We've been playing some of these, uh, the pads of the, where the market might go, have been playing to a T, like I talked about in the very, very beginning. History would say maybe, you know, if we can avoid a recession, it's an election year. There's lots of feelings about what that could bring and what that means. Obviously, it's coming November, but I want, we're stressing to investors and to our, par our Carson partners and their clients, do not just get out because you don't like who's in the White House or who might be in the White House or how the right. makeup of Congress is. This stuff matters. We're not ignoring that. But history would say, listen, don't get out just because of that. Election years tend to be strong. And again, 13.2% average in election year when you're down the previous midterm year. That's right about the range of the low double-digit returns that we're expecting. <laughs> yeah. One final thing, break it down by Democrats and Republican, Democrat and Republicans. It's about 13% on average there, so there's really no difference who's in the White House. Um, what are some other reasons you remain optimistic um, from, an, from an equity point of view here in 2024, Sonu? I think uh, say the bull market, safe to say it's a bull market, right? It's not a bear mm -hmm. market rally. I think we are hopefully beyond that. Right? The bull so. market's broadening out, right? I mean, you and I have talked about this. <clears throat> and here's, by the way, another place, I don't think we're quite seeing eye to eye. See, I'm mm -hmm. bring, trying to bring that theme Nicely. back in. I mean, not quite seeing eye to eye with everyone else. Usually large cap tech is a dominant theme in a lot of portfolios. And it's, I'm not saying we don't like large cap tech. It's sort of neutral on tech. I mean, it's such a large mm -hmm. part of the index anyway. So we're going to own a lot of it. But we really like mid caps, small caps, and some of the cyclicals, right? Industrials, financials, things like that. So I think that's where another place we're different from, I think, a lot of other folks with respect to what's in our portfolios. Mm -hmm. No, well said. I mean, we've been overweight small and mid since really the middle of last year. And let's be clear, the third quarter wasn't very fun into late October. And now maybe some some other people are starting to realize that. I mentioned this stat last week, but we had the third best two-month rally ever in the Russell 2000. Again, that small caps up like almost 22% over the, the last two months of last year. Only three were higher. But I looked at all 10 
the 10 best two-month rallies ever for the Russell 2 Sonu. One year later, higher 9 out of 10 times of 27% on average. Wow. And that's for small caps. But again, small caps, mid caps, those are the blast of strength that we've saw to end last year. The broadening out theme is one that we, we've had for a while. We expected it to take place. And maybe you could argue, you know, with the Fed pivot and the, the market sniffed out the Fed pivot. Whatever reason, starting, on, I guess, October 27th was the right. lows of the correction. The day after we, your birthday, right? Well, my birthday's the 28th, I guess. So the oh, day, yeah, right. So, before, so right. I guess my birthday present was the market bottomed and the market started to broaden out uh, like we were like we <laughs> were uh, optimistic. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> optimistic about a little higher uh, you know, statement when you get your 401k or whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. I have yeah. a question for you. We, you just mentioned we got this massive rally since October 27th. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of people have seen this. I've got questions uh, on this as well. Are you worried that we pulled forward returns mm -hmm. from the future because we have this massive rally we've yeah. had? Yeah, we very well could have a little bit. I mean, you know, the historically in election year, the first half of an election year is not all that great. February is kind of weak. I mean, maybe we consolidate a little bit. But again, I think the key thing here is, listen, the S&P is not even all time highs. We've got, I think it's 504 trading days, approximately over 500 trading days, um, you know, 200 and 50 trading days in a year, approximately. So we've got two years, right, without an all-time high. So just think about that. I mean, we've had a big run. I think we're going to consolidate. I don't think just because we up 20% last year, that doesn't mean you can't have a good year. I mean, when you mm -hmm. look at history, when you're up 20%, what happens next? Higher 80% of the time that uh, that next year, which wow. is better than your ad, average return, average year up about 71, 72% of the time. And the returns are low double-digit returns. Not spectacular, but just because you're up 20% by no means does that mean that you can't have a low double-digit, maybe even a little higher uh, potential return and where i think that higher comes in sonu for us small mid cap cyclicals industrials financials right. i mean i wouldn't be surprised at all if small caps you know gained 20 percent this, this upcoming year mid caps also you know to see that broadening out those groups have struggled those groups have struggled no mm -hmm. doubt but now that the fed is kind of out of the way interest rates are lower and like we talked about uh, one other thing we like about them hey you talk about what's cheap right what's cheap out there well right. tech's not all that cheap communication services no. not all that cheap well they just were 50 percent kind of hard they justified it with some really good earnings let's be clear but they're not they're not cheap Small caps, mid caps, financials, banks. Look at bank stocks. I mean, bank stocks are really cheap. So there are some parts of this um, this market that are cheap. And if someone's waiting to buy something cheap, we'd say those are the areas you might want to look at. Well, so we're kind of near the end when you talk about bonds. Anything else on equities before we spend a couple minutes on fixed income and wrap this up? No, I think that point about valuation is very well put, right? And I would mm -hmm. just add, uh, on the other side of that, we still like the U.S. I think we've laid out yeah. our thesis about why we like the U.S. over international. Yes, it's easy to get into home bias, I think. But I think we've laid out, uh, you'll see an outlook. Please go read it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you'll see an outlook. Why, you know, we just talk about manufacturing, construction, reshoring. The, the U.S. economy was a shining, you know, country last year. Last year now, 2023, almost caught myself there. I was going to say this year. But last year, like, it grew above trend. And whereas you have the second biggest economy that's, you know, I would say in mm -hmm. trouble, China, right? Mm -hmm. Europe's not doing amazingly well. The equity markets are doing well, but a lot yeah. of the equity markets are based on, you know, demand in the U.S., China, things like that. So it, it, it's a little more disconnected. Whereas over here in the U.S., I think uh, the economy is a little more connected to what happens yeah. in the stock market. One way or the other, it's not perfect, right? But still, there is some correlation there. At the end of the day, where do profits come from? It comes from GDP growth, right? Nominal GDP growth. So we think the economy will avoid a recession, so profit growth will be strong. No, well said there. I mean, Germany, DAX is at all-time highs or reasonably all-time highs. France, all-time mm -hmm. highs. Japan's 31-year highs. U.S. is at all-time highs. I mean, there's there's a there's a, there's a a nice theme going on that we weren't seeing this time a year ago. So let's spend a couple minutes here on fixed income. We don't always talk so much about fixed income because I think people want to talk more macro, Fed, you know, right. um, you know, stocks. But I think when we broke it down on some team meetings we had late last year, I would say we're almost more important. Um, proud is probably the way to put it. More proud of our fixed income calls. We've had some good equity calls. I mean, hopefully, if you listen to this podcast, you're aware of that and our macro calls. But our fixed income, the way we've managed fixed income and in our calls have actually been really strong as well. And we we said, you know, last year stock bonds would gain you know, maybe about five percent. It took till the end of the year rally, but that's right where things were. So do we still think bonds will do about five or six percent? So we remain underweight bonds relative to um, to stocks. But hey, you know, there's some yield there, and you're going to get some out of fixed income so believe me fixed income makes sense for the right person in the right portfolio how do you what 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 um kind of made you so um 
or what impressed you, I guess, about our fixed income call last year? And then how do you see it playing out this year? And thinking back to our 2023 outlook, I think the title, I'll have to go back exactly, but it's, I'm paraphrasing here. I think the title is something like, why take more risk? And this is just related mm-hmm. to fixed income, right? You're right. getting four. Look, by the way, this is the other impact of our rece- no recession call, right? Everyone, a lot of other shops are expecting a recession. What happens in a recession? The Fed cuts rates. Mm-hmm. We were not expecting a recession, so we didn't think the Fed would cut rates. Right. Right. So there were risk to bonds, longer term bonds, because what happens if rates continue to stay to go up, in fact, right, which is what the Fed did. They raised rates by about 100, uh, 1.25, 1.5 percent last year in 2023, in addition to what they did in 2022. So what happens when bond yields go up? Well, prices go down. That The impact is more for longer term bonds, right? You're talking seven year, 10 year, 30 year mm-hmm. treasury bonds, right? So impact is greater. So bond prices were down through October, right? Oh, yeah. and we, they're down, down through, a lot. I mean, the treasuries down, were yeah, down a good deal. Yeah, Down a lot. And this yeah. is supposed to be a safe investment. So the beginning of the year, like, why take more risk? We can get four, four and a half percent by summer if it's five percent. We could get that much in cash. Mm-hmm. And that's where we were. We were really underweight long term longer term bonds in our portfolios. But then come October, we are like, you know what? Now bonds are in a good place. We mm-hmm. see the Fed pivot coming. It's not mm-hmm. here yet. We think by right. May, June, we just talked about Fed policy, you know, maybe rate cuts coming by May or June. Probably could be fifty percent odds of as early mm-hmm. as March. At that time, you know, if rates are starting to come down, then you're better off starting to go back into longer term bonds. And with respect to how much, you know, bond returns will be in 2024, the best starting po- best starting point, I mean, you know, as good as any really expectation for what bond returns will be, just look at the yield. What's the yield? Right now, the yield on longer term bonds, you know, say about five, between five and 6%, right? That's a good estimation of what bonds will return this year. That's literally what we did last year as well. Mm-hmm. Nah, well said. I mean, we were, uh, you know, bonds were down two years in a row, right? They had a very, very rough go of it. So that we, it looked like they might be down three in a row last year, but the late yes. rally, thanks to the Fed pivot and interest rates collapsing, like we've talked about in this very podcast many, many times, um, made it. So if you had a well diversified portfolio, a 60 40 portfolio, I think you're about 16, 17%, pretty darn solid year. So mm-hmm. 60 40 was not dead. But um, with all of that, we do need to probably wrap things up um, of episode 67 of Carson's Facts versus Feelings, sponsored by Y charts um welcome to our 2024 outlook we definitely want to thank everyone who listens to this very podcast every single week um you know give us a review give us a like if you can um you know we've had a lot of momentum it's a lot of fun to do to do this type of thing and we've enjoyed it a lot you know so one quote that i have here thomas fuller an english um, thinker from the 1860s, 18, or I'm sorry, 1650, apologies. He's the <laughs> one who's credited with, I, I was wondering who this was, and I Googled it. So, you know, it came from the internet, so you know it's true. Um, <laughs> he's the one that was credited with, it's always darkest before the dawn. I was like, who said that? No. And, and it was him. And I think just this time a year ago, it was very dark. Right. It was very, very dark. Everyone was bearish. Everyone's telling you there's a recession. Everyone's telling you October is not the lows. Um, we didn't. But nonetheless, it was still a, a, a difficult, difficult time right, for, for investors. And unfortunately, I think we're going to see that again right, throughout history, throughout time. There's going to be good times. There'll be bad times. It's always going to be darkest before the dawn. As investors, I think we need to remember that to kind of step out into the light and take a chance. Well, not even take a chance. Just do, you know, just follow your process and do right and do what's right. And don't just, um, you know, get out and uh, you know listen to the. the the guy on the TV is telling you the end of the world is coming. Unless uh, the it's Arctic. Ryan, by the way. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm not. Well, I'm not saying that. Yeah, it's true. If I well, if I tell you get out of everything, maybe you should. I don't anticipate saying that anytime soon. But it reminds me of the old Art Cashin quote. You know, if um, if the end of the world is coming, you know, who's going to take the other side of the trade? It doesn't really matter, right? So you might as well use it as an opportunity. And um, with all that, everyone, thank you for listening to this podcast as much as you had for 67 podcasts um I, I don't know if you've listened to all 67 let us know i only know if i've listened to all 67 <laughs> i've been part of them i'm at i'm at a zoned out for about six or seven of them you know but um <laughs> yeah it, it's been a lot of fun and we're going to continue to do this every single week so um so new it's been fun as always chatting with you Same. and um we'll do this again we'll do this again next week i don't know what we'll talk about but we'll do it again next week take care everybody <laughs> sure. thank you Information provided on Facts versus Feeling with some of our geese and Ryan Dietrich are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. The statements and opinions of show guests may not be reflective of CWM LLC or its affiliates. 
past performance is no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested in directly. Investing involves risk, including possible loss of principal. No strategy assures success or protects against loss. To determine what may be appropriate for you, consult with your attorney, accountant, financial or tax advisor prior to investing. Guests on Facts versus Feelings are not affiliated with CWM LLC.